I believe the best way to discuss free speech is to focus on actual cases. Here are a few. 2020, a French teacher is beheaded for teaching students about free speech in relation to the cartoons drawn of Muhammad. Should people be allowed to draw cartoons that are offensive to some Muslims? Should teachers be allowed to teach the reasons why free speech is valuable and to teach this controversy in France? Number two, 1930s. There were stronger anti-Nazi hate speech laws in Germany back then than there are today in Germany. Many Nazis were imprisoned for the content of their speech, not simply inciting violence, but the content. Democratic politicians warned that freedom had become the poisonous weapon against democracy, that they should not tolerate such intolerance. So we see the paradox of tolerance rising here. Unfortunately, censoring the Nazis did not work. First, their imprisonment seemed to make them martyrs instead of dissolving or weakening their views. It actually gave the Nazi views more attention and strength. So one lesson is censorship can strengthen the views you wish to censor, in some cases at least. Another one, heavy-handed censorship gives ordinary people, rightly or wrongly, the feeling that people who cannot win debates will instead seek censorship. Number three, 2019. China banned the sitcom South Park for their irreverent humor. There is little of freedom of speech in China, to say the least. One reason they claim to censor is to protect public morality. They censor LGBTQ, pornography, positive descriptions of uh, same-sex relationships in movies, and more. Minors are forbidden to receive religious education. Some religions are approved of in China, but sex within those religions that do not conform to Chinese values, well, they will be destroyed. Case study four. In the 19th century, pro-slavery advocates were against free speech in the U.S. because they argued it was libel, emotionally damaging, and would lead to slave revolts and violence. Southern states regulated the press and prevented the dissemination of anti-slavery literature. So I encourage you to research slavery and free speech to learn more. One of the lessons is hateful people often support hate speech laws since free speech exposes and threatens their power. Free speech, perhaps, is the most powerful tool of the oppressed and those that hold minority views. Next case study, 1860. Frederick Douglass wrote his plea for free speech in which he decried the 19th century version of cancel culture. Douglass described a mob of people who attended an abolitionist meeting by yelling, threatening violence, and insulting those in attendance. Now, the mayor refused to protect the abolitionists on the grounds that they were inciting violence because of their views. Douglass explained that these men considered themselves just and lawful, but their only law was slavery. They trampled on the law of free speech and protection of public meetings. Douglas then went on to defend the sacred right of free speech. He praises free speech as a moral renovator. He notes that tyrants first strike at the right to free speech. He notes that unjust powers tremble at the right of free speech and that slavery cannot tolerate free speech. So one lesson is, do not assume you are anti-hate if you support hate speech laws and the restrictions of free speech they imply. Some of the greatest heroes in history, like Frederick Douglass, strongly supported free speech. Slave owners argued that abolitionist meetings incited violence, and they opposed free speech. Does that sound familiar? So the most valuable tool of the oppressed, of the oppressed in history has been free speech. Next case study. In 2015, 12 people were killed in the Charlie Hebdo shooting. Charlie Hebdo was a newspaper which had satirical attacks on political and religious authorities. Now, this is an example of how one extremist group, not the government, but an extremist group, attempts to control free speech and thought. This type of censorship is chilling, and it's damaging to truth, good thinking, tolerance, open-mindedness, humor, and other virtues, even though it's not the government doing the censoring here. Also, think about this. The violent gunmen are responsible for the violence, not the cartoonists who drew the cartoons of Muhammad, and they offended some, but not all of Muslims. Is that correct? If the cartoonists incited violence, why is it that they only incited violence in some Muslims? The killers are responsible for their violent actions, not the cartoonist. Think of David Chapman, who killed John Lennon. He said he was inspired to kill him because he read The Catcher in the Rye. Should we now ban The Catcher in the Rye? Of course not. People are not machines. It's more complex than that. The music, video, books did not make you do it. If they did, we would have to censor everything. There would be no end to what could incite violence in some people. You are responsible if you choose to shoot people. Next case study. In the last few years, there are many places in which anti-Zionist Jews are shouted down instead of being allowed to speak. So there are a group of people who wish to censor anyone who criticizes the state of Israel. Now, you may be censored by mobs and some governments if you seek to boycott Israel or you criticize their policies towards the Palestinians. So both liberals and conservatives constantly seek to limit free speech in their own ways. 
A better strategy is to allow argumentation. Constant debate and countering bad ideas with good ideas is the only way to really strengthen good ideas. Censorship of bad ideas weakens good ideas since people lose the deeper reasons for why they are good, which again emerges in conflicts with bad ideas. Next case study, Huckleberry Finn. So many local districts banned Huck Finn in the early 1900s because it, quote, set a bad example for the youth, used poor grammar, included a gross trifling with every fine feeling. So, for example, in the early 1900s, the Denver and Brooklyn libraries booted Huck Finn, not because of the N-word, but because they believed it was harmful to little white boys and girls. Fundamentalists wanted to ban Huck Finn uh, because Huck did not go to church. He used profane language. He didn't take religion too seriously. Later, some feminists wanted to ban it because they believe women in it are portrayed as being dumb or flighty or subservient to men. From the 1950s onward, some local districts wanted to ban Huck Finn because of that N-word. It's mentioned frequently. The fear is that it will make some students uncomfortable, especially if they're, you know, you can imagine only one black student in the class and the teacher teaches in an insensitive way. In short, Huck Finn is a book that both the left and the right and others wanted to censor at different times and for different reasons. Now, the irony is that one of the greatest anti-racist, and anti-slavery books in existence is Huck Finn. To quote Russ Baker, the people Huck and Jim encounter are drunkards, murderers, bullies, swindlers, lynchers, thieves, liars, frauds, child abusers, numbskulls, hypocrites, windbags, and traitors in human flesh. All are white. The one man of honor in this phantasmagoria is Black Jim, the runaway slave. So when you teach this book well, Huck Finn, you'll find many students asking whether the censors think they are so dumb that they can't tell a racist from an anti-racist book. You'll also find students discussing not only Huck Finn, but the First Amendment, due process, equal protection under the law, and more. In short, censorship is not new because humans are human, and they wish to silence those who question their core beliefs and values. Humans must make a special effort to not give in to the temptation to use their power to silence others. And to do that, they must more deeply love the other, separate them from their ideas, and understand why free speech is so valuable. Next case study, 1989, flag burning. So in 1974 case, Spence vs. Washington, the Supreme Court ruled that flying a U.S. flag upside down is a form of free speech, symbolic speech, and so it's protected from government interference. In 1989, the case of Texas vs. Johnson, the Supreme Court ruled that flag burning, as long as it's your own flag, of course, Flag burning is protected under the First Amendment. Now, many conservatives, as well as liberals, disagreed, and they passed a law saying you could not burn the flag. So, of course, people began burning more flags (laughs) to protest this law and the U.S. policies. In the 1990 case, U.S. v. Eichmann, the Supreme Court ruled that, quote, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. Now, since then, many members of Congress, usually conservative, have tried to prohibit flag burning because the flag is a symbol of national unity for them. Now, they have failed to do so, often because they lack a majority in the Senate or the House. Next case study. In 2012, Raif Badawi was arrested in Saudi Arabia for criticizing Islam through electronic channels. For example, he argued that people should not have to believe in Islam, though he does believe in Islam, So they shouldn't have to believe in Islam and that women should not be forbidden from walking alone. He is still in prison for violating blasphemy laws. Next case study. In 2016, a French court ruled it is hate speech for LGBTQ activists to call counter-protesters homophobes. So when you give government power to censor, it often backfires and harms the people you intend to protect. Now, for example, if I argue that you cannot degrade or question the dignity of an individual and I put that into hate speech legislation, then calling someone a homophobe may violate this hate speech legislation. Even calling one an idiot could violate it. It all depends on how a judge interprets the vague and subjective hate speech law. Next case study. Some well-intentioned parents have tried to remove the Merchant of Venice from libraries or reading lists because it depicts Jews in a negative light. So in the name of niceness or something else, people want to censor, ban, burn certain books. But isn't this a case in which we are being sensitive and kind to people but not respecting them? We are being sensitive and kind but not respecting their autonomy, intelligence, or helping them grow? Should we be teaching a child that he is so fragile, so vulnerable, so without intellectual and emotional resources that a book can lay him low? Next case study. In the 1940s, there was a debate about Article 19 when they were writing the UN Declaration of Rights, which was adopted in 1948. Now, one of the main advocates for hate speech laws was the Soviet Union. 
They wanted hate speech laws in the UN Declaration of Rights, but other countries recognized that it could be misused since any criticism of an authority could be considered hate speech. The Soviet Union wanted to restrict free speech not simply when free speech incited violence, but when it expressed views in favor of democracy and other, quote, dangerous ideas, because they argued, you know, that's violence in the long run. So one lesson is totalitarian regimes have a history of loving hate speech laws, and they despise free speech. In addition to slavery, you could research the Soviet Union on hate speech. Next case study, Skokie, the Skokie case, 1970s. So many Jewish Holocaust survivors, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court, upheld the right of neo-Nazis to march in Skokie, Illinois in 1977. Now, the neo-Nazis, if they were allowed to march, would have worn swastikas, and that surely would have reminded the survivors of friends and family who, who died in the Holocaust. Think PTSD, right? And yet, the U.S. government and many Holocaust survivors defended their right to march. And this is an extreme example of tolerance in defense of the First Amendment. So why do the Jewish survivors defend these hateful people? Because they recognize what happens when you give the government the power to silence minority groups or views. Second, the best way to combat uh, ideas and hate speech is with other ideas, love and true speech. Third, preventing others from expressing their opinions, you know, that has long-term consequences for society. And the frustrations of not being able to express your opinion will find expression in other and less desirable ways. And then finally, outlawing the content of speech in this case makes it easier to do so in the future. So in short, the Supreme Court and these Holocaust survivors, they wanted to protect the dignity of each individual, but they found that allowing free speech was the best way to do that. Next case study. In the 1970s, Dennis Lemon was fined and imprisoned for writing a poem about a Roman centurion having sex with the dead body of Jesus. The poem violated England's blasphemy laws. Consider this quote. It was a blasphemous libel concerning the Christian religion, namely an obscene poem and illustration vilifying Christ in his life and crucifixion. So this is another example of the religious attempt to censor. Next case study. In 2015, the French High Court ruled that protesters encouraging consumers to boycott Israeli goods, that they are guilty of, quote, inciting hate and violence against a nation, the nation of Israel. So BDS, a movement to boycott Israel, is illegal in France. Next case study, 2020, 15 U.S. Democrat senators asked Facebook to combat anti-Muslim bigotry. They argued that anti-Muslim posts have enabled offline violence across the country. Now notice how vague that word enable is. Notice how vague the word anti-Muslim is, which could include anything from organized violent attacks on Facebook to a kid in his basement discussing why he thinks the actions and words of Muhammad are morally wrong. And so arguably, this is one reason we need to stick to the inciting immediate physical violence criteria. The, the idea of anti-Muslim bigotry is too vague and subjective, as are the ideas, the words of hate and intolerance. Next case. In 2015, there was an attack on a free speech debate in Copenhagen. One person was killed. They were targeting a man who drew Muhammad as a dog. Free speech is rare in the human history, and it is always under attack. Next case study, 2013 Denmark. A man was arrested for criticizing Islam and Islamic immigration in his Facebook post. He called it abominable, atrocious, oppressive, and as misanthropic as Nazism. He added that it will destroy Danish society. Now, the court said, well, we should look at his comments in the context of 2013, and they argued that he wasn't just talking about the extreme elements of Islam, but Islam in general. And they said that, as a whole, his comments were insulting and degrading towards the adherents of Islam. And so he was found guilty. Now, as you think about this case, one lesson is that it's very difficult, in many cases, to distinguish laws against hate speech from laws against blasphemy. The court also used the language of, quote, inciting hatred instead of inciting immediate physical violence. And that hatred and disrespect is so subjective and vague, it could have gone either way. Does this also mean that the only acceptable introductions to world religions are those like Huston Smith's, which focus on the strengths of each religion and never mention the weaknesses? Next case study, 2020. Facebook censored John Stossel's video on the causes of California's wildfires because while it acknowledged that climate change was a cause in the video, it minimized the role of climate change. So Facebook said the information in the video was, quote, lacking context and could mislead people. 
and now it shows his channel to fewer people. So the same old question arises here. Who is determining what is and is not true, out of context or misleading? Upon researching it, Stossel found that Facebook was using a so-called independent fact checker called Climate Feedback. And again, it's an organization dedicated to discerning fact from fiction on climate issues. Now, Facebook has been under pressure to censor, and so they outsourced the censoring to biased private companies or organizations. <laughs> this is how Climate Feedback got in on the censoring. So it outsources their censoring powers to these organizations, and so this, again, leads to the same old problem. Who is doing the censoring? You may currently like who is doing the censoring, but remember, that can quickly change, right? That person can quickly change their ideas or be replaced by another person. Another issue that arises here is Facebook is a private business and has no legal obligation to protect free speech. And again, that may be true, but as we saw in video one, <clears throat> free speech is simply what is necessary for truth and virtue. And also, if you don't believe in free speech, you shouldn't pretend to. Finally, Facebook's argument is not really as strong as it seems, since we must all deter also determine if they are a publisher, a platform, a monopoly, and whether the internet has changed the game so that social media spaces are now the public spaces of debate. The bottom line is big tech is demanding conformity to their values. They are against hate, but they define what is hate, what is division, and more. So they should be more specific instead of saying they're against hate, since hate could just be the beliefs of the opposing political party. Next case study. In December of 2020, Becca Lewis wrote an article in The Guardian that far-right YouTubers have been fueling hatred in a far-right movement. So like marijuana being a gateway drug, she argued that conservatives like Ben Shapiro, quote, made it easier for viewers to move towards more extreme content. Hmm. Anyway, she then argued that the Christchurch shooter was radicalized by the videos on YouTube. And she then argues that YouTube needs to protect vulnerable communities by, for example, stopping the spread of Islamophobia. Now, of course, she appears to know exactly what Islamophobia is. And she asserts that Ben Shapiro and other conservative commentators like Crowder, Stephen Crowder, that they're Islamophobic. So you can see one major problem arising here in her argument. Who will decide what is and is not Islamophobic? Will we give fallible humans in positions of power the power to decide, or will we protect free speech? Now, of course, Becca Lewis believes she knows exactly what is Islamophobia. But again, who's doing the censoring? Well, if Islamophobia and hate are the criteria, it's very subjective. Her evidence for Ben Shapiro's Islamophobia seems to me to be very weak. So again, who's doing the censoring? For Becca, it is she or someone like her instead of you. And we would never be able to benefit from any partial truths or partial falsehoods in uh, Shapiro's views if he were censored for this reason. Even if we disagree with him, our views will become shallow because we can't expose him in debate. So the final case study is the Confederate flag. Many schools have banned displaying the Confederate flag because for many people it represents racism and slavery. Right? Now, one important reason for banning it is it seems disruptive to the educational process. It leads to shouting, violence, and a lack of concentration in classes like algebra. Private businesses have also chosen to ban merchandise displaying the flag. So several issues arise here. The first is we know free speech has limits, like libel, slander, yelling, fire, in a crowded theater. So what criteria justifies are limited in this case? It's important to be precise. Right. Second, private businesses are not restricted by the First Amendment, and so they can choose to censor. However, in the first video, I outlined the many non-political reasons for why free speech is valuable. For example, if I never read the pro-slavery arguments, or if I never read Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf, then my anti-slavery and anti-Hitler views actually become weaker. Now, in these cases, I support both the public and private institutions censoring the display of the Confederate flag, or the swastika, and other symbols that are like fighting words to most people. So am I simply being inconsistent, or is this limitation of free speech a fair application of uh, the harm principle? All right, those are the case studies. So to conclude, I think you have to examine the hundreds of real-world case studies and study the reasoning in the U.S. Supreme Court cases to formulate a reasoned opinion on free speech. Furthermore, I think you have to understand the value of free speech, which I explored in video one, before understanding its limits. You know, a hammer is incredibly valuable, though not everything's a nail. So my opinion is something like this. I'm concerned with laws that seek to limit free speech. I'm concerned with those laws that use vague and subjective criteria like hate, dignity, and degradation, because whoever is in power will, will interpret those words in ways that give them more power and demonize those who disagree with them. And because I believe human nature has a dark side as well as a good side, I'm afraid of any laws, including these vague laws, that give any one person or group of people too much power. And so I seek the separation of powers, checks and balances, and I'm a supporter of free speech even for those people with whom I strongly disagree. Right? And so it, it comes down to human nature too, my view of human nature. 
All right, that's enough for now. Thanks for listening. Bye. <clears throat>